Good. Well, we're going to um, have a chance at the, uh, after, after I've preached to share communion together and to pray with one another as we need to. Um, so we'll be uh, coming back to that. Um, but uh, this morning, we're going to continue our look at the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in particular, the start of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where Jesus announces those series of statements about how blessed the people of God are. Uh, and as we saw last week, these beatitudes, as they're called, or blessed or wonderful, and that's another translation of the word, uh, blessed or wonderful sayings, they're describing the values of the kingdom of God and of those who live in the kingdom. And uh, uh, I think, I just feel we want to pray first before we carry on. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. We believe you're going to work in our lives, work in our hearts, you're going to speak to us. Lord, thank you for the faith you've given us. Lord, we pray, increase that faith to receive your word and take it on board and live out what you're saying to us. Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. So as we're, as we're uh, taking these values on board, we're becoming more trained and more discipled and more like our teacher Jesus. Like our, our theme verse for the first part of this year from Luke 6 verse 40. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And we're being trained to be more and more like Jesus. So let's read again uh, Matthew 5 verses 3 to 10, which I've put them up there for us as well. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now when we looked at these last week, we saw how they were such a reversal of the way the world generally thinks. Especially when we saw the comparison that Luke makes using these same sayings in Luke chapter 6. And uh, you remember I put this up last week. Uh, we see here it says, Blessed are you who are poor. And then Luke goes on and says, But woe to you who are rich. <laughs> Blessed are you who hunger now. But woe to you who are well fed now. Blessed are you who weep now. Woe to you who laugh now. Blessed are you when people hate you. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. And uh, we saw how that Jesus is almost like making this comparison. Which would you rather be? Poor, hungry, sad and hated? Or rich, well-fed, happy and popular? Yes. <laughs> the trouble is, guess who, guess who turns out to be blessed? It's the complete reversal of what we would expect and what we think and certainly the reversal of what the world thinks. And last week we began to unpack this by looking at blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So today we're going to look at a couple of the other sayings. But before I start on that, I want to try, ask and try to answer, what is Jesus doing here, speaking out these sayings? And why is he doing it in this way? These sayings come across as a sort of statement of intent, a sort of announcement or a proclamation, don't they? It's a bit like politicians' five pledges for the next election type of thing. As we said last week, we can see this as a Christian manifesto. We can see it in that way. It seems to be a, a setting out of a plan of, of blessing or a statement of how blessed we are. Well, why is Jesus doing it this way and what's it all about? Well, I think we can gain some understanding of this by looking at the big picture of the story of God and the way God dealt with humanity across history uh, as we go through the Bible. So that's what I just want to take a few minutes uh, to do now. So first of all, we're going to look at the old story, the old, old story in the book of Genesis. <laughs> and we're going to start with uh, 
Uh, don't worry, I'm going to go fairly quickly. We're not going to see. <laughs> You're going to be here for 24 hours. Um, we're going to start with the, the man Abraham, called by God. Uh, God's promise to him that God would make him into a, a great nation, and that all people, that all nations, would be blessed through Abraham and his off, offspring. The problem was he was a pagan moon worshipper. He had no children and his wife was barren. And they were getting older and older and older. But still, the promises held good. And Isaac, the promised child, was born. Miraculously. A miraculous birth. They were so old. They should not have been able to have children. And later, not only that, but later Isaac was received back, as it were, from the dead. As he was about to be sacrificed just as he was about to be killed on the altar, God provided a sheep or a ram to take his place. And Abraham received his son back to life to fulfill the future plans of God that God had promised. Isaac then had two sons, Jacob and Esau. They were twins, but Esau was born just before Jacob. But Jacob was the anointed chosen one. And Jacob was to have 12 sons, a motley crew, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> but amongst them was Joseph, who was sold as a slave by his very own brothers and ended up in Egypt. But God's hand was with him there all the time. And following a severe famine, the whole of Jacob's family ended up in Egypt as well, having received enormous blessing and favour because the hand of God was on Joseph. And it was there that those 12 sons really became the fathers of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. You also need to remember that Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So Jacob became Israel and his sons became the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. But as the years passed, <coughs> those Israelites became slaves in Egypt. They were despised, they were hated. They were oppressed by the Egyptians. They needed rescuing and delivering out of Egypt. And God raised up an anointed deliverer, Moses, who was said to be the meekest man on earth. And God was going to use him. He was going to be the deliverer, rescuer. It's interesting that that word meek appears in the Beatitudes as well. And through a series of plagues and interventions of God, the whole nation of Israel was set free as the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites. You remember, some of you will remember the story. Blood was painted on the doorposts of the houses. And when the angel of death saw the blood, he passed over them, hence Passover, and they were saved. And they were not subject to judgment, which is part of the origin of the communion that we're going to be taking later on. And they left Egypt. They were pursued by the enemy, but they left. And they came to the, the Red Sea, hemmed in by the Red Sea. But God was with Moses. And by God's power, the waters parted. And they went through the Red Sea and arrived on the other side. Delivered, set free, escaped, rescued by the hand of God. Hallelujah. But now they were in the desert wilderness. Being led by God, God had led them there. They were also being tested by God and they were tempted in all sorts of ways. Now, to be honest, usually they didn't do so very well with the temptations. <laughs> they ended up grumbling and complaining and ended up, in fact, worshipping a handmade golden calf, a sort of DIY God. Uh, that's how they ended up. But God led them eventually to Mount Sinai and there Moses, their leader and deliverer, was given the Ten Commandments as a guide and tutor to lead them the rest of the way. <coughs> the goal was going to be the promised land across the Jordan. It was Joshua who was to lead them into the promised land. And guess what? Joshua is another name, another version of the name Jesus. It's quite a story, isn't it? Spanning hundreds and hundreds of years with a call, a promise, a blessing, hardship, deliverance, temptation, the law given, and being led to the promised land by a Jesus-type figure. Amazing. 
So what does all this have to do with Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus announces these new statements of blessing and values? Well, let's look at the story uh, that leads up to Matthew 5, where uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Mount is. And uh, we're going to look at the new story now. We've had the old story, now here's the new story from the beginning of Matthew. We find the people of Israel are oppressed. They're under Roman rule. They're needing help. But still, they've got the hope for the future, hope for a future with a coming Messiah. They believe in a coming Messiah. Sadly, they don't recognise him when he comes, but they do have that hope. And we're then introduced in Matthew's Gospel to Mary, who's engaged to be married to Joseph who is in the line of one of those 12 tribes of Israel back in the Old Testament. In fact, he's from, the, he's from the tribe of Judah. And God's messenger tells them that they will have a son, born to Mary as a virgin, without the intervention of Joseph, born of the Holy Spirit, and this son is to be named Jesus, Emmanuel, and is to be the saviour and deliverer and rescuer of the people. A miracle child for a miracle purpose. The child's born, as prophesied, in Bethlehem, but his life is immediately in danger from the Roman king and the family flee to Egypt, into exile in a foreign land. Like the Israelites of old, they end up in Egypt. After some while, they return to Israel. And Jesus grows up and Jesus himself is baptised in the river going into the water just as the Israelites went into the Red Sea and were delivered. So Jesus went down into the water and came up again and was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Then as the Israelites, just as for the Israelites, he's also led by the Spirit into the desert, into the desert wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. This time, Unlike the people before, he beats every temptation and is victorious every time and the devil flees. Only then does he begin his ministry, teaching and healing and calling disciples. And Matthew then places the giving of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, the blessed values of the Kingdom of God, right at the beginning of his ministry, reminding us of the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, here is, the giving, here is the giving of the Beatitudes on the Sermon of the Mount. So the parallels between the Old Testament and the New Testament story are uncanny. <laughs> They're wonderful. They're significant. This has all been planned by the hand of God. And this is clearly saying, Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, and he's announcing, and he's proclaiming, the kingdom of God has come now. I'm here. This is it. The kingdom of God has come. The Old Testament story was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was bringing in, in a new way. The kingdom now has come with Jesus. To start in the here and now, says Jesus, this is the arrival. This is the start of the kingdom of God. With Jesus, we have heaven invading earth, if you like. This teaching isn't to wait until the future when we get to heaven. It's heaven come now in blessing and to be lived in the blessing of these announcements more and more and more and more as we allow God the Holy Spirit to, uh, by his grace to, to work in our lives. That's why a few verses later Jesus was to teach his disciples to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not eventually when Jesus comes again but on earth. As it is in heaven, your kingdom come. That's where we are now. So that's what Jesus is up to here with this teaching. He's announcing the new kingdom. And those who put their faith in him, trusting him for salvation, get to be part of these blessings. So have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you believed in Jesus who died for you and rose from the dead? to make you right with God, then filled you with his Holy Spirit. That's what he does for each and every person who puts their trust in him and receives him. Have you been baptised as a believer to show that you are a follower of Jesus? Even Jesus was baptised. Of all people who didn't need to be baptised, he did to show us as an example. <laughs> we need to be baptised as a consenting believer 
to show that we're a follower of Jesus. So then, let's have a look at another couple of these blessings. We did one last week. Let's look at a, a further two of them. And uh, we're going to uh, look at these two. And if we combine the version in Matthew and the version in Luke, we get the following. Blessed are you who hunger now, or hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be satisfied or filled. And the second one, blessed are you who weep or mourn now, for you will laugh or be comforted. So let's take, uh, let's take the first one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus talks not about those who are hungry, but those who hunger. And there is a difference there, isn't there? <laughs> it's those who realise that they need something more in life who are going to be blessed. They need to find true life, true happiness, true blessedness, true satisfaction that will last. Those are the people who will find life and be filled and satisfied. Those who know they need to find this. Those who feel they have no need of God, no need of genuine relationship, no need of a true eternal life and meaning, they'll find out in the end that they will be forever hungry and thirsty. Our society is, is driven, isn't it, by, by what we can have now, what we can get now, whether it's things, whether it's experience, whether it's short-term relationships, or the quick fix of food or drink or drugs or sex or whatever. It's all, about, it's all about now, what we can get now. But Jesus offers the true eternal life of knowing him and coming into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. This is worth everything, worth hungering and thirsting for. It's like the little parable, such a small little parable, this, that Jesus told of the merchant in Matthew 13. The parable is just one, one sentence, really. God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for exquisite pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. That's the parable. <laughs> It involves a, a rich man, a businessman, a pearl fancier or a jeweller. And he's been searching intently and diligently for a long time for just the right pearl, just the right <coughs> business opportunity, just the right niche in the market, just the right investment opportunity. He's seen many things of value. He bought into a lot of them. All the latest fads he's investigated. But he had never seen anything like this pearl. Such beauty, such perfection, such shininess, such purity. The loveliest thing in the world. And he sold up, sold everything to buy that pearl. <laughs> Speaks to us, doesn't it? <laughs> Some people are like that. They try all sorts of faiths and ideas and hobbies and philosophies. And maybe even they gain something from some of them. But then they find the pearl of great price. And everything else pales into insignificance. I remember when I was um, in uh, Tajikistan, we were visiting an a extended family in one of the villages outside of the town where we lived. And, uh, of course, they offered us a meal. And we sat down and we were sitting around in this large guest room on the floor, as you do, with a, a tablecloth on the floor with all the food spread out. And uh, meals in that sort of culture take hours and hours <laughs> because it's all about hospitality and, uh, uh, and relationship. And I was sitting next to an older lady, much older lady. And I knew she was a Christian, actually. Um, and uh, out of politeness because of the, the male-female thing in that culture, I wasn't engaging much in conversation with her uh, because that would have been inappropriate. But she started to engage in conversation with me, so I was able to... Uh, respond to that and she said our oh, brother David she said um, you know I used to be one of the uh, teaching women of Islam in the village my job was uh, uh, was to go around the houses to all the women to, and to teach them about Islam and uh, because women generally weren't allowed in the mosque so that's how the women got their teaching and discipleship uh, from from uh, the Islamic faith and she was one of those women who went around teaching everybody about Islam she said and then then I found Jesus 
and she said, uh, she said to me, she said, you know, there's nothing like it in Islam. Just the love I know in Jesus and the love I know for my Father God. You can't find that anywhere else, she said. Islam has got nothing uh, like that at all. It was such a, such a simple and wonderful testimony and she was just beaming. She was just beaming because she'd found the true pearl. The mm. true pearl. She tried Islam for most of her life, in fact. And it had not lived up to uh, the pearl of great price, Jesus. That's the parable of the kingdom of God. And it talks, about, talks to us as well, doesn't it? God is looking for those who will intentionally, I've written this down here, intentionally, intentionally, diligently, earnestly, enthusiastically, energetically, emotionally, passionately, excitedly go after the kingdom of God. <laughs> you get the message. <laughs> until they find it. And people who won't settle until they see more of the kingdom of God in their hearts and in their church and in their community in which they live. There's a sense in which we will always be set unsettled because there is always more. <laughs> there's, a right, there's a right way of being unsettled and a wrong way of being unsettled. <laughs> if you know your peace with God, you can be unsettled in the sense of you want more. You want to know more of the love of God. You want to know more of the peace of God. You want to see more of the kingdom of God in your life, in your church, and in your local community. Have you set your heart on the kingdom of God? Is God your priority, what you seek after in your life? To know him more. That's the way that leads to eternal security and satisfaction. This... Uh, Neatly leads us on to the. This leads, leads us on to the next blessing. Blessed are you who weep or mourn, for you will laugh or be comforted. And you think, well, how does this work? <laughs> this seems a strange one. Well, it speaks, it speaks a number of things. But one of the things it speaks, it speaks against those who have a kind of sort of flippant approach to life, who would just joke their way through life not taking responsibility, not tackling anything worthwhile, or who deny there are any problems or difficulties or any suffering in the world, is a sort of, again, it's a sort of, I don't need God, everything's okay sort of attitude. It's also a bury your head in the sand approach as well. Instead, we are called to face challenges and face suffering and take responsibilities and be aware that we do need God. No, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Sorry about that, but that's not my words, that's Jesus' words. <laughs> Life does bring its trials and its challenges. I don't have to tell most of you that. <laughs> and at times life will bring suffering as well. I'm reminded of Romans 5 and uh, verse, the, from verse 3 where it says, we can rejoice too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You see, God can and does use the problems and trials and even the suffering that we may face for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And we look to him and we seek him in that. That's one aspect of what it means to be blessed if you weep or mourn. Because actually, God can use it for good. Another aspect is that we should, and it's right and proper, that we should mourn and be sad over injustice. That is a proper and right response. Whether it's modern day slavery or poverty, or abortion, or abuse, or corruption, or racial prejudice, etc., etc., etc. And where appropriate, we, we, we do. We help, and we support, and we speak out. It's good to be concerned. That is another aspect of this, that Jesus is saying, now don't bury your head in the sand and pretend there's nothing wrong. We know in this world there's plenty wrong, and we should be concerned about it. And when we have opportunity, we help, and we support, and we speak out. Of course, it's also right, we have to include this as well, to be concerned about our own sin 
and wrongdoing. There's a mourning and a weeping over our own sin at times. That should lead us to repentance and turning back to God. And that is a blessing. That is a blessing. You know, as we go on with God, as we get to know him better, we also find the Holy Spirit speaks to us about our own sin and our own attitudes. And we don't, again, we don't bury our heads in the sand and say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm all right. <laughs> Actually, we recognize, oh, God, perhaps I need to repent of that. <laughs> perhaps I need to put that right. Perhaps I need to start afresh. We turn back to God and we find the blessedness of forgiveness. So when we face challenges and sickness and injustice and sin with a right, realistic, humble and, if necessary, repentant attitude, we'll find the blessing of God. We'll find the comfort of God. We'll even find a holy joy in knowing that God is with us. For most of us, God loves us, well, all of us, God loves us far more than we love ourselves. <laughs> all of us, definitely. <laughs> God loves us far more than we love ourselves. We need to appreciate God loves you. And that means he likes you. He doesn't just put up with you. <laughs> As I said before in a previous, um, you're not the awkward one that God puts up with. God loves you. <laughs> and he likes you. And yes, there's sin. Yes, there's background. Yes, there's baggage. But God forgives. I think the challenge is to have such a secure relationship with God through Jesus Christ that we face these challenges and problems of life whether it's our own issues or those of the world around us but we face them with faith and perseverance and endurance and commitment to find God's comfort and support and hope and joy Jesus promises that <coughs> I'm reminded of my friend David Greenaway who some of you will know um, he used to come, come here lives um, just across the way and he has He's, uh, he's a very elderly man and he has very serious terminal cancer. And from time to time, go and visit him. Uh, he prays for us every day, by the way, as a church. Every day he prays for us. He always asks after you. Um, and he says, please give my love to the church. So I'm giving that now. Uh, but when I go and visit him, his face is just shining with joy and love. He's just saying, I just can't wait to see Jesus face to face. He said, I've got to go through this. And it's not very nice, and it isn't very nice. And I always pray for peace and comfort for him, and that God will take him um, at the right time. But he's got such a joy in his heart that it shows on his face. <laughs> and it is just amazing. He's finding the truth of those words. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And he laughs as well. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's summarise a bit before we... Uh, respond and take communion together Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God he has arrived and the kingdom has arrived and we're invited and welcomed into God's kingdom have you received Jesus have you made him your Lord and Saviour and turned to follow him putting your faith and trust in him completely have you been baptised as a follower of Jesus showing your deliverance and trust in Jesus the kingdom has values that are so opposite to what we expect. They sort of pull us up short. <laughs> and they challenge us to put all our eggs in the one basket of God's kingdom. <laughs> Have you set your heart on the kingdom of God? Is God your priority? What you seek after in your life? To know him more. That way leads to eternal security. And can I ask the question, how are you developing your relationship with God? Three prime ways. In community and fellowship, that's how we develop our relationship with God. In prayer, that's how we develop our relationship with God. And in knowing his word, and then in obedience to his word, of course. Those are the three areas that we need always to be involved in and seeking, because that's how we develop. Do you know your security in God as a child of your heavenly Father? So that when challenges arise... And they will. You are secure and face things with faith and hope, even in the dark times, with deep roots in God, maybe repenting of sin and wrongdoing where necessary, caring 
caring about injustice and wrongdoing and seeing where God leads you in that. Finding the comfort of God in trials and sufferings, whether they're big major things or whether they're apparently not so, not so major. But knowing that the joy of the Lord can be your strength. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be satisfied. Do you believe that? Yes. Blessed are you who weep or mourn, for you will laugh and be comforted. Do you believe that? Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Let's, let's pray.